Let me see them Bibles. You got Bibles? Hold them up. Thank you, thank you. Electronic Bibles, let me see those. If you do not have a Bible and you have a smartphone, rib the person next to you and have them share the church app with you. There's a Bible program built into that. And so you'll get calendar, video library, Bible app, all the good stuff on there. And uh, it'll be a lot easier for you to follow along. I don't want you to take anything that I'm saying for granted. I want you to see where it's coming from and make sure that I'm reading the word. Turn to be pleased to the book of Song. Song. So many people say songs. I've, I've done that, but if you look at the top, it says song. It's almost in the middle of the Bible. It's about the first third. I'm reading out of the, the New Living, and this is going to be the launch pad and the, the main text that we're pulling from today. How many like that graphic? <laughs> uh, huh? Who said that? Interesting, yeah. So one of my favorite ones, that there's two videos that my video repertoire is getting better. There's, there's one guy right now that they play this. It's a scaring video where somebody's always coming around the corner and boo and scaring them or using an air horn and stuff. I get tickled at some of that stuff. This one guy in particular sitting at a table eating cereal and somebody plays this pop, 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 like a gunfire. He's up jumping, running around, ducking. And I laughed till I cried, just laughed until I cried. Um, another video uh, is the one where the guy is trying to show people how gunpowder works. And so he's down at the table and he's striking, striking, striking. And I mean, his hair is everywhere. His face is all black. And I mean, you, you know his ears are ringing. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then another one is, how many's ever started a charcoal grill? Huh? How many's used the, the lighter fluid? How many of the lighter fluids got out of hand? So people make me nervous whenever they think, they say, I know what I'm doing, I know what I'm doing. And they're squeezing. That fire can come up out of that grill, burn that, that, that stream all the way up to the bottle and cause that bottle to explode in your hand. This guy was worse than that. This one had a gas can. And so he's doing that, he's pouring it, and sure enough, that Who's guilty of doing the gas can? Oh, Bill. Bill, Bill, Bill. So he's pouring this, he's pouring this, this, this gasoline on this fire. The fire comes up, follows it all the way up to the gas can. He sees it coming up to the gas can, and he freaks out. So he, th he goes like this, and then he throws it. And when he throws it, now the whole yard's on fire. He's rolling around in the fire. He's on fire. And so those are the kind of images that I have when I see something like this to make matters worse. It was, it was, it was already a bad thing that you, inexperienced, had a gas can in your hand around a fire. Ah. So how many's ever seen somebody was having a bad day? And you could tell by looking at them he's having a bad day. And so you decided, I got nine lives, let's poke the burr. <laughs> so you say something stupid like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> An hour later, you woke up <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> I think all too often when trouble is in our life, we panic. And we're like the guy with the gas can. <laughs> and we're making matters worse. So I want to discuss what we can do. First of all, this is not only a love letter. This is full of examples of what to do and what not to do. Okay? So we're going to have a little bit of both today in Psalm 107. Verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, 
for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Now, pause. How many of you don't just wave because you think it's the cool thing to do and you're going to look stupid if you don't, but how many of you would say, I have truly experienced the faithful love of God, that when I felt down, he was faithful. When I was high, he was faithful. When I was, when I was wealthy, he was faithful. When I was on the street, his faithfulness has always been a mainstay in my life. Can I see those hands? You need to look around the room. For those of you wondering whether or not God is trustworthy, you need to understand that there are many, 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 many testimonies of the faithfulness of God in people's lives. Verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that he has redeemed them from the power of the foe. And he's gathered them from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Some wandered in the desolate wilderness, finding no way to a city where they could live. They were hungry and thirsty, and their spirits failed within them. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he rescued them from their distress. <laughs> How many ever been a wanderer? Just a wandering. Verse 7, he led them by the right path to go to a city where they could live. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. For he has satisfied the thirsty and filled the hungry with good things. Verse 10, others sat in darkness and gloom, prisoners in cruel chains, because they rebelled against God's commands and despise the counsel of the Most High. I'm going to tell you what I see when I read that passage. How many just sat in a, in a dark bedroom on the edge of the bed or in the floor just bawling your eyes out? That's what I'm seeing when I'm reading this passage. They sat in darkness and gloom, prisoners in cruel chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the counsel of the Most High. He broke their spirits with hard labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and gloom and broke their chains apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love. Verse 17. Fools! suffered affliction because of their rebellious ways and their iniquities. They loathed all food. Yeah, you got to be stupid to do that. And came near the gates of death. How many have starved yourself almost to death? Tell the truth. Yeah. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. I'm not rereading the same verses. This, this is, we're moving on. You, are you seeing a theme here? He rescued them from the pit. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. Verse 23, others went to sea in ships conducting trade on the vast water. They saw the Lord's works and his wondrous works in the deep. He spoke and raised a stormy wind that stirred up the waves of the sea, rising up to the sky, sinking down to the depths, their courage melting away in anguish. They reeled and staggered like a drunkard, and all their skill was useless. Here's the picture I'm seeing. They are so scared, they forgot everything they knew. That's like being a police officer in training for hand-to-hand -hand combat, and you get a hold of your first hired drunk guy with a knife, and all your training oozed out your ears. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They rejoiced when the waves grew quiet, and then he guided them to the harbor that they longed for. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love. I give you that text because Psalm 107 really is a call to worship. It's a call to worship. It's a reminder of the faithfulness of God. Not just in a nation's history, although you can look back through nation's history and see that God was faithful to nations, but this is also having to do with individual experiences. And in this, we find 
two key revelations that we need to learn tonight, but learning it is not enough. I'm so tired of people that have so much knowledge that their head can't hardly fit in the door, you know, when they're going somewhere, but they have no application skills. They have, they've contained all the knowledge, but they, they don't know how to use it. So two key points today that we've got to learn, but also apply. The first is how God's love is expressed through trouble. How many just be honest and wave at me and say, I'm in trouble today. <laughs> i got some troubles going on in my life. They are significant. Yeah. So this, this understanding equips us to respond wisely to troubles instead of resenting God and wondering, where are you, Lord? And then secondly, we're going to find out how genuine worship is actually birthed in our hearts. Worship is not just something that, that happens when you get goosebumps because you hear a thumping bass or a great melody line or somebody with an incredible voice. Worship is something that really is a response of the heart that is willfully desiring to lift up and to magnify God. It's hard to do that when you don't understand the blessings in your life came from him. I've, how many daydream? I've daydreamed. And I thought, if I ever had a windfall, if I just had a bunch of money, what would I do? I'm going to tell you a secret. I already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a company. I ain't going to tell you the name of it because then you'd know it was me. <laughs> and this company is going to receive gifts to give to other people so that they don't know it. I'll give you an example. Let's say Royce, his, his truck exploded. He's got nothing, right? And Cameron came into a windfall of money. And he knows that the truck that he wants is $30,000. But he knows if he just gave him $30,000, he probably wouldn't go to the truck. And if he gave him $30,000, he's going to say, well, how much more money you got? You give me thirty. what else you got? Come on, human mind is the way it works. So what he's going to do is he's going to come and give my company the thirty grand and say, I want Royce to have a new truck. So my company's going to go down to the car lot, going to buy the truck, going to deliver it to Royce, videoing him on GoPro, right? And then when he says, well, who did this? An angel of the Lord did it. And then I'm going to send that video to Cameron so Cameron can rejoice, right? But then guess what? Because they're tight. So Royce is going to boom, 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 come over to Cameron's house. Man, you got to see what God did. And Cameron's going to come out there. Oh, my God, no way. When did that happen? So he can rejoice with Royce, rejoice in God without Royce ever thinking that Cameron's his source instead of God. I thought it was a pretty good idea myself. Well, y'all be taking my idea. That's my, that's my idea. How many knows the story of Job? Lost it all. I dare say he found some serious trouble, wouldn't you? Financial loss, deaths in the family, personal sickness, and unexpected troubles of various sorts. How did he deal with it? Better yet, how are you dealing with the trouble in your life? How many of you, whenever you found yourself in a lot of trouble, your first call was to the Lord? How many of you when, you, when you first found that you were in trouble, you ran to the Word of God to find a solution? See, most believers don't do that. They exhaust every other source. Hey, man, I need you to meet with me for lunch. I'm really having a tough time, and I just need you to help me. I need you to pray for me. I need you to get a word from God for me, and I need David had a lot of wonderful experiences with God. He had some great, wonderful, awesome victories, if you want to know the truth, but he also had a lot of trouble along the way. His king went berserk and tried to kill him with a spear. King Saul started chasing him across the country like a common criminal. He had a son die as a judgment of God. He had strife in his family. He had kids who rebelled. 
There was wonderful times in David's life where he danced before the Lord. Just a joy dance. Have you ever seen those videos where military personnel comes home, they surprise the family? How about the one where daddy comes home and a little two or three year old little girl? She's all dancing and just screaming and doesn't know what to do with herself. Huh? Even dogs, German shepherds especially, take them to the airport. Where's daddy? Where's daddy? Where's daddy? All of a sudden he sees daddy, jumps through the window, takes off running, and acts like a puppy this big, just, you know, just all up and we got to learn how to rejoice in the Lord. Here's our problem. We're so concerned that if we start rejoicing in God, then the enemy's going to know that we're having success and we're going to be a bigger target. So we try to keep the rejoicing down to a minimum to be covert rejoicers. And what needs to happen is we need to be having a barn burning kind of scenario. You know what I'm saying? Where we're just celebrating the Lord out loud, rejoicing for the world to see and giving the devil a throat punch. Listen, we, you know, in October the 31st, on Halloween Day, it will be three years to the day that we took we occupied this building. It would have been so easy. It would have been so easy to wait till November. But we wanted it on October 31st. Why? Want to throat punch the devil on his day. Anybody hear anything I'm saying? Want to do it on purpose. So if we're going to be, if we're going to be brazen enough to throat punch the devil and, and start having services here on October the 31st, we need to be magnifying the successes that God gives us. Celebrate the goodness of God. I'm going to say this. You get what you celebrate. You do. You get what you celebrate. You say, well, there's been a lot of problems happening in my life, and I ain't been celebrating those problems. Watch this. To celebrate goodness, you rejoice and you have parties. To celebrate bad things, you become introverted, isolated, doom, gloom, hang out in your bedroom with the lights out, bawling your eyes out. That is a celebration of bad things. You want to know why a lot of people have a hard time coming to church? Because when they're having difficult times, they don't want to see Frank going, how you doing, man? Great to see you. They just, come on, man. Get your back off. Just pff, leave me alone. Right? Because I'm living in doom and gloom right now, and I don't need you interrupting the environment that I worked so hard to produce. <laughs> so when people are really having a difficult time, and problems have showed up in their life, and they're depressed, and they're irritated, and they're angry, and they're sad, and they're sorrowful, and they're all this stuff. They want to stay where? Home. Bedside assembly. Why? Because they don't want to be around people that are loving and rejoicing and laughing and celebrating and clapping and singing and dancing. And they don't want none of that. They want to incubate their nonsense. They are celebrating their doom and gloom. The problem is when you drag darkness into the light, it don't stay dark. This, we got to be honest, man. Ministry is tough. It's like trying to build a house to live in out of toothpicks. Ministry is hard. It's hard to get people to want to subscribe to a vision, watch this, that they have to work for and participate with. So what they do is they wait to find somebody else who's got a successful ministry and they go pile in with them because everybody wants to be about success. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. Ministry's tough. I'm going to be real transparent for a second. I really believe the Lord's transitioning us. And I'm biting more off in the natural than I ever would if I didn't feel like I had the blessing of the Lord to do it. But I'm telling you the next facility, I think people of our own house are going to walk you going. <laughs> and I've wondered how many people who came eh, and got a whole lot of offering when they find out what God's doing and what we're possessing 
and what God is going to produce out of that, I wonder how many will have by then been disenchanted. Can I say it like this? They've already picked the fruit off the tree they were at. I'm sorry, am I being too honest? Do I need to go back being real humble? I've wondered how many people would come back because everybody likes a good party. Well, let me move on because I can see that's made y'all quite uncomfortable. So in Psalm 107, we find four groups of people. The first one we saw in verses 4 through 9, they were the wanderers. People just wandering through life, just bumping into folk. They don't even know why they're there. You know, they had the old saying, it is what it is, and whatever will be, will be. Que sera, sera. They're just kind of, they're floating around. They're living in a wasteland. They're constantly hungry. They're constantly thirsty. They're constantly unsatisfied. They're not able to find any kind of a place of contentment or satisfaction. They find themselves frustrated constantly and always unfulfilled. They're wanderers. Verse 4 said, some wandered in desert wastelands. Verse 5 said, they were hungry and thirsty and their lives ebbed away. Anybody feel like your life is just kind of ebbing away? It's just disappearing. You wake up and 10 years went by. Anybody feeling unfulfilled? See, half or more of you just lied right there because you didn't even raise your Listen, listen to what I'm saying. Mom and dad used to sing a song. Maybe one day I'll get them to sing it. Uh, anybody want to live forever? Say I do. Anybody want to walk on the golden streets? Say I do. Anybody sick and tired of living like you do? Anybody here want to live forever? Say I do. And we have a lot of people that won't even say I do. Try getting married without saying, I do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You got to be careful. But you also, you got to commit. I'm going to say it because we're on film. Marriage weekend's coming up. Want to know why a lot of people don't want to show up there? Because they are as committed as they want to be in the relationship that they're in. And if they're confronted with information that tells them that they're doing a, a terrible job and they need to up their game, they're going to be mad. So they'd rather live in ignorance and keep the status quo than do what's necessary to grow. That's how people are with church. Second group of people was the prisoners. People that are depressed, constantly in a state of gloom. They are the equivalent of Eeyore. I'm fine. <laughs> they have financial problems. They have relationship problems. They have addictions and complications. They have all kinds of things that's going on that make them prisoners of their own devices. Verse 11 specifically says, They got themselves in the mess, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Yeah, I won't say this too. If you don't go to marriage weekend, don't call me when your marriage is jacked up. Because if you won't show up when we're making the whole weekend all about you, then don't call me when it's on your time because my time is over. Does that make sense? Awesome. I'm sorry. Is that not plain enough? I, I, you know, I feel like I, I might need to get a video like God coming down with the finger and writing it on the wall for you. Go to marriage weekend. You know what I'm saying? See, some of y'all are like, that's so funny. Some of y'all are like, I don't know about this guy. They rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. You cannot despise this and then complain that the relationship you're in is broken because you refuse to consort the manual. Uh, 
I don't know how many times I've taken people through deliverance. I wonder if the Lord's going to give me that tabulation at the, when I get to glory. By the way, in case you were wondering, it was 1,655,000. You know, I just wonder, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but I've told people so many times, you can't treat deliverance like the golden ticket to get out of your mess. And I've told them, said, you didn't get into this mess overnight. You walked into this. You made some dumb choices. You, you picked some bad things to do. You got into some bad habits, some bad conversations, some bad relationships, some bad financial stuff, bad jobs. You, you just, it was one bad decision after another that got you into the quagmire that you're in, and now you want somebody to come in and, you know, it don't work that way. So Jesus is going to help you to see him rightly, get the right prescription in the glass, and you can go, oh, there you are, Lord, so that you can follow him. But you walked into this mess. He's now going to take you by the hand and walk you out. That's why he says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, so I can see where in the world I'm going. It's step by step by step by step. Then, no, 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 I can't, I can't short circuit this one. Most troubles in my own life have been self-imposed. Come on, late fees come because I missed the due date. Right? Um, flat tires came because I was driving off-road in a street-worthy vehicle. Y'all ain't hearing nothing. Knocking the engine came because I used the cheap oil and then, you know, didn't change it frequently. Y'all ain't hearing anything at all. Jonah got into the belly of the fish because he rebelled against God. God just didn't say, oh, wouldn't it be funny if Jonah fell in the water and swallowed him up by some stanky fish? No, Jonah made some dumb choices running from God that caused him to get tossed by the people he was running with. Oh, God help me right now. There's some of you in this room right now, you think you're hanging out with people that just got your back. Yo, they got your back all right. You don't even understand that when God deals with them about you, even the ones you thought you're in crime together, those people that were with you will turn on you and throw you in the water so you get swallowed up by fish because not even people that are disobeying God will disobey him when it's about you. You're marked. If you've been coming here for any length of time, you know enough truth. You are marked. You are stamped. You know what I mean, stamped? You guys been in enough bars. You go in there, you pay your cover fee. They stand. Only this stamp don't come off in the wash. Because when you get stamped, it's there forever. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? So you can go anywhere you want to go, but people go, you shouldn't be here. Why shouldn't I be here? Because I see the stamp on your life. Here's the flip side of that coin. Some of you are stamped and you know you're stamped. But that's a false sense of security. Because you keep hanging with the wrong people, doing the wrong stuff, thinking you're going to be okay because you're stamped. No, you're just going to be judged a little bit more harshly because you were stupid. <laughs> I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way. But sometimes when you're sleeping, getting woke up is not a fun thing. <laughs> huh? How many has been woken up out of sound sleep? I got woke up the other day. I thought I had my phone on silent, man. No, I did not. And I was deep. Y'all, I wasn't just snoozing. I was, I was deep. And I was in some sort of a prophetic dream that I could not get back to. And I got woke up so harshly. And woke up, huh, what, huh. And so here I go, and I, I start walking. I'm, I'm catching myself on walls. My head is spinning. Why? I was asleep. You got people like that living for Jesus, asleep. Oh, yeah. I remember when I was learning how to drive a stick shift. I focused on every gear. Okay, neutral, first. And after a few whiplash, I found second. Huh? Huh? 
And then, then it got to where I'm pretty good. First, here we go. Here we go. One, one, one. I'm looking around. See that? I'm in third gear. Right? Look at this. I'm pretty good. And then it got scary because I'd come from college, and it was about a 40-minute drive. And I remember leaving the college, and I remember pulling into the driveway, but I don't remember anything in between. And I wondered, A, how did I get here? And B, how did I shift all them gears? This is what happens when you get into religious rut. We go to church on Sunday. We make half the Thursdays to make everybody think we're still living right. Y'all ain't hear anything. We'll show up for the potlucks because everybody got to see us on them days. But what we're doing is we're sleep driving. Anybody was a sleepwalker? As a kid, I was a sleepwalker. I understand. I did too. I grew out of it, I think. <laughs> My parents would tell me, you, sl- you, you were sleepwalking last night. I remember doing that. Well, I don't remember doing it. I remember being told that I did it. Uh, at my grandparents' house living out in the country. And they had the old creakety floor so you could tell where somebody was in the house. You know, you know where they were. And then you had the old-fashioned the storm door. So they heard the door slapping. So they wind up following me. I went out the gate. I don't know where I went. Roamed around, came back outside, went to bed. Then when we were in Moore, they told me of another time. Um, <laughs> when you're a kid and mom and dad's door is closed, you don't open it. You, just, you don't open it. That's just a rule. It's a rule, right? Middle of the night, I got up, opened the door. They're in bed looking, uh, Joel, what are you doing? And from what they told me, I'm going to the bathroom. So I walked around their bed, went over to their bathroom, walked in, shut the door, opened the door just as quick, walked back out, went back to bed. (laughs) Now I say that for this reason. There's sometimes when people come and say, listen, pastor, I need to talk to you. There's just some stuff going on in my life. I see the look on your face. You're sleepwalking. You ain't even there. You, you, you. (laughs) You're going to have to get conscious before you can make a choice and a decision because everything you're saying when you're asleep don't count. Does that make sense? There's a different look. You've got to be careful you wake them up too. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there, there, there's, there, ah, there's a difference. People have a different look, a different walk, a different speech. So you have to determine, are you... Are you really asking me for help, wisdom, accountability, instruction? Are you just going about the what you see everybody else doing? I've said this before, but I said, I wonder what it would be like if there was a cemetery had green lights and red lights on the tombstones, and at night you could go to the cemetery and God would light the lights and you knew who went to heaven and who went to hell. I wonder if that would change the way that we viewed life. I wonder if, if, if God would allow that to happen even in this room and I turned off the lights. And if you were glowing red or glowing green, wake him up, he's sleepwalking. I wonder if it, would, if it would make us want to change course. Hebrews 12, verse 10. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he, dis- he, being God, disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems sad and painful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Let me put that in English for you. I got a lot of whoopings when I was a kid. So I'm a little flatter back there. And while it was happening, 
I was very irritated thinking about all my friends that could do whatever they wanted to do, and they never got, they never got anything. Then I got older. And all the friends that got to do whatever they wanted to do, for the most part, are in major trouble, jail, or dead. It's crazy for me when I'm inviting people to church using the Facebook event, and I'm scrolling through, dead, 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 dead. Facebook needs to come up with a group of deceased so it has a little banner or something on there so that you know that they're no longer with us, but it keeps the page alive because if you tell them that they're dead, they just kill the page, then you lose all the memories. I don't know why I said that. At Facebook, that's free. If you do that, I want 10%. You know, it's, it's a great idea. You just need to do that. Okay. So when you find yourself getting in trouble, you know, I had kids tell me, I didn't believe them. When I was growing up, I wish my parents would tell me no. Shut up, man. You know you're going to that concert. You know you're going to that sleepover. You know you're going to you know, that, that lock-in. You know you can do all that stuff. Just shut up. No, you don't. Yeah, I just wish my parents. Well, why in the world do you wish that? Because at least I know they cared. So you have wanderers. You have prisoners. Verse 17, the next group. It's called fools. Some became fools, it says, through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. That's verses 17 to 22 of Psalm 107. So I need you to hear that it wasn't a mean old devil that did it to them. They're not, they're, they're not victims of somebody else. They're victims of their own fate that they created by their own stupidity and bad choices. They got themselves into trouble. One of the things that irritates me about our society today is it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, it's always somebody else's fault. Wasn't nobody else's fault that I had too much to drink. Wasn't nobody else's fault that I went driving when I had too much to drink. It wasn't nobody else's fault when I wrapped my car around a tree. Y'all don't hear anything. But you'll go to counselors and psychologists, psychiatrists, well, it was your great, great granddaddy's fault. He's the one that he had to steal back in them days. He was selling whiskey. <laughs> We're going to blame him. Wasn't his fault. Now, he had his own dumb choices, but that doesn't absolve me of my dumb choices. <laughs> then there was the merchants. Verses 23 to 32, that's the last group. This is people that just got busy making a living. And I think if we're not careful, every one of us can fall into that trap. We're just busy making a living. You wake up, and you, this has happened even this week. I woke up, I didn't know what day it was. And before you go saying that's old age, I'm just saying... When you wake up tired and you go to bed tired and you sleep and when you wake up you're still tired then you wake up and you don't know if you're at the beginning of a new tired or the tail end of an old tired. <laughs> so it takes you a minute to kind of get your equilibrium. And so I think every one of us can fall into this particular rut if we're not careful. That's why the Bible tells us seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. I'm going to say it like this. I'm not the richest guy in the world. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. I'm not. I'm not the poorest. I'm not as wealthy as I want to be, but I'm probably as wealthy as I need to be. Hear what I'm telling you. Because I have learned enough to know that really wealthy people have a hard time sleeping anyway because they're terrified somebody's going to find a way to steal their money. And they don't know if people that say, hey, my name is Billy Bob and I'd just like to be your friend. If, if, 
if that happens to me now, I might think Billy Bob just wants to be my friend. But if i got a bunch of zeros after my name, I'll be a little concerned as to whether or not Billy Bob wants to be my friend or my money's friend. You see what I'm saying? So I am content with knowing that my wealth is just at a different location that I'm on my way to seeing. I want to live in such a way here that I'm storing there. Does that make sense? So for all of you down in the mully grubs, your car don't run right, your house leaks, your plumbing's backed up and all that kind of stuff, just understand, none of that matters. None of it matters. Store up your, for yourself treasures in glory. So for those of you that are dealing with trouble, I'm going to say this. This is a disclaimer. Not all trouble is a correction from God. Not all trouble is a correction from God. Paul had a lot of trouble when he was doing everything that God told him to do. He did everything God said do, and he still found himself in trouble. So you can be in trouble whether you're in the will or out of the will of God. The, pro- the, the benefit is that if you're in trouble in the will of God, he's going to get you out. If you're in trouble out of the will of God, you're on your own. So here's the five steps very quickly that happened in every one of those scenarios. The first thing is it was a chosen path by the people involved. The path that you're on today is one that you picked. You picked the job, you picked the house, you picked the car, you picked your income, you picked your mate, you you picked everything. What you're in right now is a chosen path. Secondly, problems are inevitable. They're going to come. So what's the solution? We see the third thing that happens in all four of those instances. Desperate prayer. Verses 6, 13, 19, and 28. Desperate prayer. What's desperate prayer? Desperate prayer is one that doesn't even necessarily make sense. Have you, ever, have you ever tried to help a child that got into mess, they wrecked their bicycle, skinned a knee or something, and they couldn't even talk? And so they, you say, what's going on, baby? And they run up to you. And you just kind of, huh? Doesn't even make sense. But God knows the heart of what's going on. And he'll let us babble. Because we need to have expression and we need to get it out. But desperate prayer doesn't even have to make sense. Desperate prayer can be ramblings. Now, my mom was great training for my wife. Because if you've ever been in conversations with them, they switch gears and don't tell you. Be talking about a recipe, then we're talking about Christmas, then we're talking about church, then we're talking about new vehicles, then we're talking about, and you got to find out, oh, we, we, oh we're, 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 we, we switched somewhere back here, right? Prayer can be a whole lot like that. God, my wife, and then my kids, and my job, and all my goodness, and then the church, the, the church, you can't be in that all the It's just like this, this stew. This pot. But God knows how to make sense of all of that. Desperate prayer is less concerned about the form and more concerned about, God, I don't even care. Let me just vomit this thing out. I need help. Help. I've listened to a lot of speeches, a lot of messages, a lot of public speaking over the years. And every once in a while, I'll catch myself saying something and it'll irritate me because It's either improper grammar, improper use of a word, or if you're reading and it's a misspelled, how about there, there, and there? That's an irritant. Okay, we had to go to class, go through through English class and learn what the there, there, and theirs are for, right? And how to spell them. Anyway. Um, And so even in conversations sometimes where people are using hick phrases, Oaky language, slang. And I hear it, I go, really? You going to say it like that for real? For real? But in a desperate prayer, none of it matters. 
None of it matters. I think some people refuse to come to the Lord because they don't know how to come to the Lord. If you're one that doesn't know how, how to come to the Lord, start by saying two words. Jesus, help. You just came to the Lord. So you pick the path you're on. Troubles are inevitable. Desperate prayer is necessary. I'm skipping. And in each one of those instances, deliverance happened. Power happened. You heard me say repeatedly in Psalm 107, and he delivered them from their distresses. In every case, God answered their cry. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So I want you to understand there's nothing going on in your life that God can't fix. I've never met anyone that knew God very well at all that didn't walk through some trouble in their journey. Yeah. Lastly, worship. Worship comes out of thanksgiving to God because he delivered us out of our distresses. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This is why I believe a lot of people don't understand how to worship God. Because they haven't done one through four. They haven't had desperate prayers. They haven't cried out to God. They haven't seen God deliver them and set them free. How many ever heard of a man named John Newton? I mean, he's never heard of John Newton. How I many didn't vote? Lazy people. John Newton goes through the horror of being a slave to the slaves in West Africa. He was rescued, but on the voyage home, a storm came like the one described in Psalms and others, and it should have meant the end of his life. In that storm, he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord delivered him. In an expression of worship and gratitude to the Lord, he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace, a song that we're still singing 200 years later. Trouble is a fact of life. Pain is a fact of life. Disappointment is a fact of life. How you handle it is up to you. Here's another term for desperate prayer. Ugly prayer. How many ever seen a picture of you when you were crying? And you said, oh, man, I'm an ugly crier. Oh, it's an ugly cry. I think in desperation, I think in desperation, anything's acceptable. Makeup, no makeup, shorts, pants, ball caps, ponytails, goatees, contacts, glasses. None of it matters. Could it be that when you look at somebody, you can identify that something's wrong that that might be God nudging you that they need 
a desperate prayer. How many of you have been going through stuff and it got so bad that you felt bottled up and you felt bloated and constipated? And I don't mean that in the natural. I mean that in the spiritual. It's like you're just, and you get no relief. It's like you're stretched and there's, there's, no, there's no release. I remember when the, when the kids were little babies, if they got... If they got gassy but nothing was coming out, sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose, if you lay them on their back and take their little legs, grab their ankles and push them up and go, <clears throat> what if, what if your hug <clears throat> what if it takes you praying for them to pop that balloon in their life that gives them release and relief? What if it's your call, your text, your email, your DM, your IM? Good grief. We have so many ways of contacting people anymore. What if it's a physical touch? What if it's a smile? What if it's a kindness? Don't just dismiss that, oh, well, they're just wearing it all over their face because not everybody can understand what they're wearing. If you understand what they're wearing, it could be that God's speaking to you about being a blessing to them to help them to find their ugly prayer. I know enough about the group of people in here to know that most of you understand the look of somebody who's high or intoxicated. And when a friend comes to your house that's high or intoxicated, you don't tell them, get in your truck and go home. What you do is you say, why don't you come in here and talk to me for a minute? You put on a coffee, a pot of coffee, and you talk to them for a while. You put some coffee in them. You might drown them in the sink a little bit, but you're going to do something to sober them up. Why? Because you recognize I really believe that most of you in this room are more astute spiritually to recognize what's happening in somebody else's life than what you've given yourself credit for. In fact, you've almost gone backwards and gone inward and gotten upset and said, well, if God's people was God's people, then they'd recognize that I'm having a difficult time and they would say something to me. Why do I have to be the one to go find them and let them know it's okay, I'm going to love you, I'm going to help you, let's have, let's have an ugly prayer together. And so you wind up being upset because other people aren't doing that for you. If you want friends, you must first show yourself. Nobody wants to be first, unless it's first in line at Six Flags. So here's what I want to do. Psalm 107 is not exhaustive. It just gave us four categories of people. And you may or may not have identified in whole or in part with one or multiples. But the way out is still the same. Desperate prayer. I think too often we come to church and it's easy to criticize the pastor. When I first started coming to that church, man, the prophetic really flowed. So I'll come here for a prophetic word, and I didn't get it. So bless God, I don't want to have to. Maybe the prophetic is not released because you haven't had your ugly prayer yet. Maybe you haven't given it all up to Jesus yet, so he ain't got nothing to say to you because you've avoided the last five prophetic words that you got. They are not for some, they're not something for you to collect. Or they're something for you to act on. You catch what I'm saying? So I'm saying we need to learn how to really release ourselves to the Lord because I'm no good to you if I'm spiritually bloated and constipated. Nor are you good to me or anybody else in that same condition. So we need to give each other some grace. And if you see somebody going through it, you might just need to pull up alongside them and say, hey, we need to have an ugly cry together. Can, can, I, can I start, can I kick start the desperate prayer? 
Because the desperate prayer really just gets it all out and says, God, here's everything that's bothering me. You said, cast all my cares on you. I'm dumping it, man. Because I can't get clean, healed, mended, or restored until I get rid of the infection. I can't get rid of the infection as long as I withhold it. I have to release that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an opportunity to offer desperate prayers. If you want to come to the front, you're welcome. If you want to make an altar where you're at, you're welcome. If this is just too much for you and you can't handle it and you're just going to leave, you're welcome. It doesn't have to happen here, but it does have to happen. It does have to happen. You will never receive satisfaction for anything that comes through myself or through Rachel if you haven't had a desperate prayer with God to let everything out. He doesn't want us carrying stuff that he didn't give us to carry. He doesn't want everything else to be more important than him. Not the clock, not the job, not the ball game, not the TV show, not the movies. He wants nothing more important than him. I'm going to pray for you in just a second. For those that are watching online, I hope that you receive some, some blessings, some insight, some encouragement, maybe some permission just to have a meltdown between you and God. I pray that you'll do just that. If you're looking for a church family, we're looking to grow the house here at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., every Thursday evening at 6.45 p.m. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.